Okay, 500, 499, 498, 497. Are you getting ready? 496, 495. Three, two, one. Good morning. Kind of wanted to count down for 500, but whatever. You take long, dude. Good! It's crooked. Wait. Morning. Good morning, everybody. She was gone. So sad. So sad. So sad. Super sad. Super sad. But her um, son Eric texted me. Yeah, she got home. <clears throat> she got home safely to Ohio. Yes, to the Buckeye State. Yeah, I've never met anyone from Ohio that I know of. Have you? Yeah, I, I just finished saying that my sister has fam. My sisters have family from over there. Yesterday, remember I was sharing that with oh, her. Oh yeah. Hello, where were you? It's like were you not there in the conversation no, I or remember. something? I remember now. Okay, yeah, yeah. So. So shout outs to Ohio. Yes. Do you guys like my hat? You see what it says? It says, Honduras, Central America. Who got that for you? You did, babe. He wanted to show that he's married to an Hondureña. Caltracha. So, <laughs> so we left, um, Sister She left the airport in Oakland, and uh, we got on. Wait, wait, wait. What? You got to start that it's, we've been gone since. Oh, yeah. Eight o'clock this morning to go. They to, already know it's a long day. No, it really has been a long day, you guys, because we left since eight o'clock. You guys should be so proud of me. Anyways, <clears throat> we really, really left since eight o'clock this morning to go take Sister Sheila to the Oakland airport. Okay, can I take it off for now? Yeah. Because you can't really see me. Okay. So we left this morning to go take Sister... Oh, my hair. Sister. You got to see that this is... Like, hand done. I like, this is not a design. This is actual, like, that straw, like a straw hat. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, um, we left. We went to go take her to the airport. Yeah. And then from there, we drove over to Petaluma. To Petaluma because we had to pick up... Um, 20 20 chairs for the church 20 chairs for, for the, the new church, church yeah 20 building. chairs for the new church building which which was a really good deal because mm -hmm. i have been looking for used chairs because buying brand new chairs i mean we still need more but it's hard to find the brown chairs that we have because um part of the chairs that we have at the at the church right now those green ones that are there belong to the building that we're in right now so we need more of the brown chairs or not we're not going to have seating for everybody so i've been looking and looking and looking for um chairs and each one of those chairs the brown chairs are like 34.95 per chair before tax before tax so that's almost like you know almost like 40 dollars per chair and that's expensive and i just happen to keep looking on facebook market you guys know I love to look for budgets, okay? So, and I'm a thrift sh shopper, you know? So, I ended up finding somebody who had just 20 of them. And she had them for $250. And I was like, you know, hey, you know, we're <coughs> looking, you know, to lease, you know, a building where a church, you know? And, and when she found out that we're a church and everything, she brought the price down $25, which was still a blessing. Yeah. But for 20 chairs for $225, um, and when we when we said, you know, yeah, we'll take them, by faith, we said, yes, we'll take them. One of the sisters at the church was like, hey, I'll pay for those 20, you know, for those 20 chairs. And um, we went to literally uh, go pick those up today. But yeah. see, when we got there today, we didn't know that she had those chairs upstairs so but brand new those chairs would have been eight hundred dollars no nine hundred and something dollars and then because oh, forty dollars times 20 is 800 is 800 yeah that's yeah you sure hey seriously don't 
double check me on the video. <laughs> That's a simple number. It'd be like something you ask a second year old. Are you sure? Oh, well, yeah. $800. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> I'm not that dumb, guys. I promise. <laughs> Anyways. I was a drug dealer. Trust me. I know how to count. <laughs> Anyhow. So we ended up going there. Ended up having to go up and down, up and down these stairs, bringing down all the chairs. David had to strap some, uh, two of them on top, get him all loaded into the SUV. And then from there, um, we had to take care of some other matters all the way back in Sacramento. So we went all the way from Petaluma mm -hmm. all the way back to Sacramento and Sacramento all the way back home. And it was like a whole day. We just walked in, which it's not too late. It's 7, 7 12. Yeah, 7 12. But, but you've been driving. We've been le we left at 8 in the morning. Yeah. So it's been, it's, been a, it's been a pretty busy day today. But we stopped at a little flea market or yeah. a swap meet off the freeway. Yeah. Right when we dropped off Sheila. And I found the most amazing thing. A Bible. And I want to read out of it today. Well, I want to share actually about that Bible. You guys want to know something that I didn't realize, but you know, we, we seen a whole bunch of books on the floor and they were a dollar. And I turn, I turn around and I see David. I can share this, right? Um, well, I see David and I can see a brokenness in him and, you know, like I see him really teary eyed, you know, and I thought something was wrong. And I and I said, David, what's wrong, you know? And he says, I just pay for this, you know, and I said, well, you know, and, and he says, I don't I can't bear to see this on, on the ground. And then I looked down and and it was the Bible. And it was, you know, the, the the Gideon Bible, you know, and like the hotel has, like the hotel Bibles. And when I when I see how when I saw how broken he was, it, it almost brought tears to my eyes because, you know, I've told you guys before, you know, you know how much what a Bible means to him. Of course, it means to all of us, you know, but you know, just for him to be to see that on the ground. It was, you know, like seeing Jesus trampled on the ground, you know? It was like a, a flea market, but more like a... It's a lot of used stuff. A items. lot of used stuff. Almost like a garage sale. A huge garage sale. And everybody had their own lot. So a lot of things were on the floor. I mean, there was tools. There was, I mean, just different people had different things. And this person had a lot of different stuff just laying on the floor. And it was a pile of books just on the floor. And he goes, oh, a dollar for each one. And then I saw the Bible. I saw this Bible, and, and I don't know. I, I don't know. It just it messed me up. It messed me up seeing it just there because it was a parking lot, uh, and it was gravel and... Dirt. You yeah, know. And, and I didn't even know how much it was at the time. I just picked it up. I didn't care what it was going to cost. I was going to buy it because I couldn't leave the Word of God on the floor. It doesn't deserve to be there. You know, this Bible doesn't deserve to be there. You know, and, and it's like, this is going to, it's going to live here until I decide to give it to somebody that's going to love it, you know, but it's going to, um, so this book that was on the floor is now going to get read to hundreds of you. Yes. Today's devotional, you know, so it was a, apart from being a busy day is a very special day because throughout this busy day. We were able to pick up this beautiful special word from this Bible today, and we want to share from it. We want to share with all of you today. This, this Bible deserves to be read from. Amen. Amen. So I'm excited um, with what the Lord has placed in our hearts today, and I'm excited about a lot of things, you know, and even through our busy, busy moments and through through all of it you know there may be times you know it's it's funny because even in the car <coughs> you know i have the women's bible study and i have things going you know i'm i'm trying to study as we're driving and i'm i'm reading you know my word in there and i'm trying to write as we go and we're doing this and we're doing that and there's just so much 
going on it's like you try to get as much done in between so much and you're listening to as much as you can you know of the word and we're trying to converse we're trying to fill um, calendars and and try to talk to as many people as we can from the church and there's just a lot that needs to get done but in, in in the midst of all of that we don't we don't forget to stop just to thank god for for all that he continues to do in our lives and you know and we get excited to come home to want to just share with each and every one of you um because of because of his goodness and what he does so i'm really excited with what you're going to share today so yeah. let's just get right into it so um today i wanted to talk about a few things but this is one of the verses that kind of springboards into the subject it's a second thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10 or at least starting at verse 10 okay um <clears throat> so actually you know what let's um let's back up there let's start in verse 6 second thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6 hold on let's see good all right and it go I'm reading out of the Gideon translation, so it might sound different than my normal King James uh, or New King James that I normally read out of. But like I said, I want to make sure that this Bible is read out of today because this who knows how long this has been there on the floor and it deserves to be read. So um, I walked off hugging this thing. Hmm. Did you smell it? Yeah, I already did. You did? Yeah. Okay. Word of God always smells good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, verse 6, it says, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a command that Paul is talking to the church in Thessalonica. He goes, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know you ought to follow us. Oh, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Verse 9, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Verse 11, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Verse 12, Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Last verse, 14, and if anyone does not obey our words in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Actually, verse 15, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Mm. Wow. 6 through 15. Got it. Our order is backed up by the master Jesus are to refuse to have anything to do with those among you who are lazy and refuse to work the way we taught you. Don't permit them to freeload on the rest. We showed you how to pull your weight when we were with you, so get on with it. We didn't sit around on your hands expecting others to take care of us. In fact, we worked our fingers to the bone, up half the night moonlighting so you wouldn't be burdened with taking care of us. And if it wasn't because we didn't have a right to your support, we did. We simply wanted to provide an example of diligence, hoping it would prove contagious wow don't you remember the rule we had? <coughs> sorry don't you remember the rule we had when we lived with you if you don't work you don't eat and now we're getting reports that a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings are taking advantage of you this must not be tolerated we command them to get to work immediately no excuses no arguments and earn their own keep friends don't slack off in doing your duty if anyone refuses to obey our clear command written in this letter, don't let him get by with it. Point out such a person and refuse to subsidize his freeloading. 
Maybe then he'll think twice, but don't treat him as an enemy. Sit him down and talk about the problem as someone who cares. Damn. Okay. <clears throat> this is what this brought this on. Is that we as believers, many times we want to run before we crawl. Many times we want to do ministry in front of thousands, but not minister to those in our home. Many times we want to feed people and, and, and feed the hungry, which all is awesome. But you, don't can't, but you don't want to work to feed your own family. And, and so I guess what, 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 what I'm getting to is this, is there's so many times that the little things that should be the foundation are the things that are forgotten about. Yeah. I mean, Paul is being really straightforward. And he's like, listen, we moonlight. I love the fact that he says moonlight because, see, Paul, he, he made tents. He was a tent maker. Yeah. So he would spend his whole day preaching the gospel and teaching the gospel. And then when everybody's asleep, then he would make tents just so he can be able to eat and, and sustain himself. He's like, I'm not going to be freeloading off of anybody. I'm going to preach and I'm going to do whatever it is I need to do, but I'm going to earn my keep too. Because you know what? If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. You know, and, and this doesn't, I'm not talking about a nine to five job. This is talking deeper than that. Well, it doesn't give people a reason why to talk either. Yeah, exactly. Like, <clears throat> you know, can you imagine if all we do is sit around judging other believers, but you yourself are sitting at home while somebody else is working to feed you? I'm talking to the men. Mm -hmm. um, seriously? We go to work. We do what we have to do to sustain, you know, and, and it's like that is a basic principle. It took me many years to learn that. Honestly, obviously, I went to prison because I was doing the wrong thing. You know what I mean? I was not a Christian. And, and there's things that that um, my father, my dad instilled in me from a child. But nevertheless, now as now as somebody that teaches and preaches the word of God how dare I go and teach and preach yet I'm disorderly here in the house you know don't sit around saying I'm the man of the house but I send you to work and pay the bills here I wouldn't let that happen then actually you'd be the man of the house you know what I'm saying it's like we can't do this, guys. I'm talking to guys. We can't do this. If you want to be in order, then be in order. You can't pick and choose and call things out the way you see it without letting, without, without putting the mirror on your own life and on your own home. How can you do that? Because what happens, right, if we go around attacking other believers, what happens is it, it, it makes... How does that make God look? Because everything that's done in the dark is always shown in the light. And what happens when that reflection comes back and people say, this is the person that was saying this and saying that, and look at their home. Look at the disorderliness. Look at who's, who's the head of this house. How, you know, and, and it's just a big mess that, that, that Paul, like, I don't know what was happening in the church in Thessalonica, but obviously Paul had to come down hard. Yeah. You know, he says, don't you remember the rule we had when we lived with you? If you don't work, you don't eat. He goes, and now we're getting reports that a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings are taking advantage of you. This must not be tolerated. We command them to get to work immediately. No excuses, no arguments, and earn your own keep. Friends, don't slack off in doing your duty. And if anyone refuses to obey this, then don't let them get by. Actually, the other translation says, don't even, don't even fellowship with that brother doesn't mean make him an enemy. Paul's like, I'm not telling you to make enemies of people. But you need, we need to sit people down. We need to let people know this is not the right way to do things. I understand. Here's the thing, right? I, I, the reason I say I don't believe it pertains to just 9 to 5 is there's some people that they can't work. But you know what? They do work toward the kingdom. Yeah. I, I, I have a, an amazing sister in Christ. 
that she can't work. But what did she do? She went to help this home, this women's home. Remember? Mm -hmm. To help them because she knows she has time. And she can't work for, for reasons that are personal to her. But she went day after day after day helping to build this women's home that was going to be, it's a non-profit thing. I love that. Yeah, she puts her time. And, she puts and, her time yeah. and her effort in saying, you know what, I can do something. Yeah. And just because she's not getting a paycheck doesn't mean she ain't working. It's, it's like she's pushing forward with the gospel and being a good example of that. You know, and, and, and that goes along all the way. You know, I love the fact, like, we're getting this, this new building. And there's a couple brothers I said, and I... I I know you do work with wood, you know, and, and, and you're busy. And, and is there any way you can help us out? We need, we need to build a stage. We need to, you know, and they're like, Adam, he goes, one of them said, matter of fact, he was on between jobs, man. He was, of course, I'll do it. Of course, he was whatever it takes, whatever for Jesus, Amen. you know, and it's like, I said, well, what do you charge? He goes, man, if you want to bless me, then that's fine. But I'm doing it for God. Amen. You know, and it's like that that is putting in work. That is. Not being a busybody. That's not being a, a, a lazy, what is it called? A, la a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings that are just sitting around, <clears throat> you know. And when I went to the Raider game, you know what's funny? Is all these guys were yelling at the players down there with beer and pizza. And I'm like, are you serious? Like, I'm enjoying the game, but I wouldn't dare yell at the quarterback what he's doing wrong while I'm just sitting here on a chair and unfortunately that happens in Christianity people sit in a chair and just nitpick what everybody else is doing become spectators yeah maybe you can nitpick on everybody else because you ain't doing nothing yourself because that's idleness that's idleness well I think that can happen as well in a marriage I think a lot of the times we as women, too, we want to live beyond our means or we want to become a little high maintenance instead of just living um, with with what we need and we want a little bit more. And sometimes, you know, we, we see that the man will go out and do everything that you're saying and everything, but it's not enough, you know. And, 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 and the women take, take, take. Yeah, and, and, you know, and sometimes it's not enough, but see, he's already doing and providing and mm -hmm. and meeting those obligations and he's being the hard worker and he's doing all of that but a lot of the times we got to be very careful um as the woman of that household as the woman of god that we got to continue to encourage that man of god that we don't push push yeah. it over that limit as well and i think that's important too so there has to be <coughs> a, a balance yeah. as well yeah my yeah yeah i'm sorry, sorry yeah I so i think that's that's a, a very very important thing too and i think that goes vice versa mm -hmm. um with with both because i think that's why ministry it's so important that it has to be equally yoked on both on both parts and that's why it says that it's so important that you're equally yoked because it brings that balance you know spiritually yeah. so that there can be that balance so um yeah. I think that's that's another important important thing to yeah. to bring up. Well, in, in in growing up, I love that I'm going to kind of elaborate with that. In growing up, I'm going to use an example exactly exactly what Sharon is saying. My dad worked as a farmer all his life. I I can honestly tell you that I never had a steak to myself until I was an adult and bought myself one. I had never ever had a steak. My dad was a hard worker. I didn't know people ate steaks alone. <laughs> I didn't know that because my mom would get a steak and she'd cut it into cubes and she put it in beans and, and maybe get a no, nopal or a cactus, nopales, and chop that up. And, and you will turn that little steak into this huge meal and it would have chunks of steak in it. And then we all ate. But if you would have put all that together, it would have made one steak. But here's the thing. Never did my mom say this is all, this, I can't get everybody steaks for this. My mom worked with what she had and she provided a dinner. She provided a home. And, and it's like, and my dad worked hard, you know, and never, never did I grow up angry. Never did I grow up like, I want my own steak. That was just life. And I didn't think I was poor, you know, and, and I don't think we're poor because my, like, I didn't grow up with, with government cheese and, and, and food stamps. Nothing wrong with that, but I didn't grow up with I that. I did. 
Yeah, I didn't grow up with it. Well, I didn't that. grow up with it, but that's what I provided my kids yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, I didn't grow up with it, but but my dad, it was normal to see my dad coming home tired and dirty and dusty from the tractors, and that was normal. And he would come in, and he would take a shower, and by the time he got out that shower, that plate was sitting there for my dad. And I and, bet you I had a nice little steak for him. Well, he never had a whole steak either. None of us. Mm. No, we never... It was... I. I only saw people eating steaks on commercials. Oh, wow. I didn't know people ate whole steaks. But, you know, my dad probably had a bigger portion than us Mm because we were kids. Mm -hmm. You know, but I love the fact that you bring up balance. You know, there's something about about Sharon that um, she's one of the classiest women that I know. And what's crazy about it is that she doesn't go to Macy's. She doesn't go to Dillard's. I, I I, I... I would love to be able to take her there, you know, but I don't even know if she would want to. I don't. (laughs) She will, she goes, we go to thrift stores because she prefers that and she finds amazing things that makes a beautiful outfit and makes her look gorgeous and, you know, and it's like, and she's happy with that. That's not, now that doesn't make, that doesn't give me the right to slack off and say, oh, my wife will always wear hand-me-downs. I always aspire for more. I always want to work harder. I always want to make more. So I don't want to become that lazy, good-for-nothing person that says, ah, she's good with that and that's all she'll ever get. No, I have aspirations. I've never heard him say anything like that, you guys. You know, I have aspirations, but nevertheless, she finds the balance because what does she do? She knows where we're at and she makes it happen she makes dinner happen. She makes a home happen. I don't understand how we came into this house and even furnished it, but she makes it happen, you know? And um, I think the only thing we had new is, is our couches. Everything else was given to us or things she already had or had in storage from moving down from LA or I mean from Southern California, you know? But so when, when Sharon says to find that balance, she's not talking just out the side of her neck. She's talking by experience and her own life. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's and it's true, and you know, and I and I say this from experience, you know, um, I think ladies, you know, women, ladies, I I say this because I think it's so important because if you do not find that balance and if you do not know how to find it, then what you can do is you can tear that man down, you can tear um, your marriage down by by not doing that <coughs> or by doing that i'm sorry and and it's really really important and it can happen really really fast and that's the that's the one thing that that god does not want in a marriage because once you lose that the walls begin to build up and once those walls uh begin to build up they're really really hard to tear down and you don't want to live your life uh, tearing down walls. It, it's 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 a really really hard thing to do, and I suppose that they are. You know, um, you know I I do tell women it's so important to have communication, and I would rather I would rather have balance in our life, and communication, and um, be needing things together but have that balance and everything and and i don't i don't need the extravagant i don't need any of that because you know what god's going to provide and as long as we have what we need we're going to be happy you know and and you got to have that balance it is very very important now i wanted to touch on another thing um that you did talk about you know um one mistake that i made as a parent as a mother and you know becoming so busy and this is a really really huge thing because david just just mentioned something early um i was a mom who because i wanted to find a place of refuge because i wanted to find um (coughs) that place where i felt safe and everything i became so busy in the things of ministry that I can never say no. I can never say no to ministry because I was trying to find myself. And a lot of the times when you get so busy in ministry that um, we forget those that are closest to us, those that need Jesus more, which are our children, our wives, our husband, and those that are in our home. 
and I was that mom, you know, I was that mom and that my children, I carried them everywhere that I went. There I was, I had my kids with me, um, take them to every event. Um, and, and, you know, in my mind, I thought, well, people, I had the people that were close to me, like my mom and my sisters and stuff. They would always tell me, what are you doing? You know, all you are, you're always at church. You're always this, you're always that. And see, in a lot of the times we can't really see it because we think, oh, you guys aren't saved. You guys don't know, you know, you guys are just saying that, you know, and a lot of the times we think that the world is just against us, but sometimes other people will be able to see things a little bit clearer than what we see ourselves. And, you know, and, and we really do think that people do come against us, but, you know, sometimes other people can have a little bit of wisdom too. And, you know, and, and I wasn't able to see it, but the thing is, is that after time, um, I, I began to see the effects that it took on my children that by me putting ministry first, it did have an effect on my children. Um, my children began to resent the things of God. It mm. began to hurt them to the point where they began to be, they became angry with me that I put everybody else before, you know, if, if I had something I would share with everybody and I, and because I always needed to do for others and always needed to do and always needed to do because I no longer knew how to say no anymore. Yeah. Because it was almost embarrassing for me to say no because everybody got so used to me saying yes that I didn't know how to say no anymore. And it almost became like I it was, everything was done out of obligation almost. And when once you start doing things out of obligation, you start losing why you love doing what you love and it goes back to what we talked about today that when you do something for someone and they begin to want you to do things out of obligation you no longer love doing the reason why you love doing it so it's so important and i say this to men i'm gonna be so honest with you that if you're doing ministry and you're doing ministry and ministry and ministry and you're constantly going out and you feel and you think that your wife is constantly always going with you and going with you and going with you, stop for a moment and don't think that she's just going with you because it's something that she always wants to do. Take the time to stop and spend time with your family at home because she probably goes with you because she feels the need that she has to it's not always because she just wants to. Yes, doing the things of God is important, but your first ministry is your home. A woman wants to be at her first ministry. We desire to be fed the word of God at home. We desire to have that time to be able to build that foundation from our home. Because when that time and that fan hits and things begin to hit, that foundation has to be strong at home before anything so that you can sustain and withstand anything. And it all begins from your home, which is your first ministry. So it is so important that you stop and give your family time. It is so important. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, I, I came from the music industry and, um, I think if I wanted to, and and I would be, I could be able to book my weekends with talking, with all these things because of who I used to be. And, and especially if I started doing rap music, you know, it's like, oh my God, Sir Donald did this, and 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 like I'm I'm gonna like I'm finishing my book. I could, I know that I can book my weekends all all the time. Yeah, we've talked about you maybe yeah. even starting to record music again or do something, and we're but like, no. I'm like, you know what? Those things are great. They're great tools for ministry. But what good is that? I would rather sit here on a Saturday instead of somewhere else. I'm sorry. Will I do that sometimes? Yeah, of course. You know, of course. You know, when, when God opens doors. But I'm not putting myself out there. I enjoy being here with my wife. I enjoy 
spending time. You know, I get my daughter every other week. I enjoy those times. And it's like, I have older kids. We have older kids. So I realize now that you blink, boom, they're grown. Yeah. So like, my daughter is 16. In a couple of years, she's going to be a young adult. And I'm going to say, man, I wish I could get those weekends. Yeah. But I was out ministering. I'm sorry. I, I want to I wanna enjoy my last few years before she becomes an adult. Yeah. You know, that's what's going to last. That's what's going to hold. Yeah. And, and on my, and, and if I ever <clears throat> get the opportunity, you know, on my deathbed, it's going to be her that's there. Yeah. And that's just the way it is, you know. So, guys, quit trying to be Superman for the world and be Superman to your wife. Quit trying to be a superman or superhero for the world and be a superman or superhero for your children. And, and why do you think for us it's so important when we do hang out with our families from our church? Mm-hmm. Why do you think that we're hanging out with them, like literally fellowshipping with them? The fellowship that we have with them is not going out to minister every minute that we can. It's not going out to like, Oh my God, I got to go speak. I got to go speak. I got to go speak. It's not because that doesn't always necessarily, you want to know what ministering and, and being evangelistic is. It's pouring into them by fellowshipping with them is by loving them is by giving them that love of Christ. And that means spending time with their children and spending time with them and building that family relationship with them and teaching them by leading them by example and showing them what family is and what it is to come together break bread together and do those things with them that's what we do yeah you know sitting around that big old conference table and all Mm -hmm. of us eating together and laughing oh my god to the point where we can't even hold our stomachs anymore because we need to laugh together we need to cry together we need to just come into our living room the other day we all just there was a few of us here and we just all kind of laid our heads against one another went to the bakery together and did things together yeah that's what it's all about yeah you know and it's like you know sheila can be a witness that she came and spent a few days with us um all day long is ministry whether it was in church or whether it's in the living room and it's not just all talking about scripture uh, from my understanding, and I don't want to speak for her, but it seemed like she was able to see yeah. what it's supposed to be like. I pray that that's what she saw, and <laughs> she'll comment on here. So, look, you know, if she comments, it, it'll be Sheila Skaggs. I want Sheila, I want you to comment. And um, I think she learned a lot, not just by hearing preachings and teaching, but just being here and soaking it up because this is what it's about. Yeah, And I think that's what Paul was conveying here. He's like, man, I will moonlight and make tents at night so I can spend time with you because I need to have a balance here and I need to provide for myself because I don't want to be a freeloader off of you. And I mean, there's just so much, guys. So we're already at 38 minutes. I think um, we made some good points. And um, if this rattles some feathers, well, then maybe they had to be. You know, but it's all right. It's all right because what is Thanksgiving's Paul's- coming, so we need our feathers rattled. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> what does Paul say at the end? He says, um, "Don't treat the person as an enemy, yeah. but sit them down and talk about the problem as someone who cares." So I'm not doing this video to rebuke. I'm doing this because maybe there's a problem, and, and we're doing it as somebody that cares. Yeah, you know, you know, this I- is us sitting with you right now. Yeah, you know. I, I had seen, um, uh, there was a baby Christian that came in and I remember seeing that there was a video that she had posted and, you know, and I was able to, with love, you know, talk to her and share with her. And, and that's the thing when you love somebody, you share with them and you don't scold, you don't sit there and you don't do any of that. But you know what? you 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 share with them out of love and you can even share an experience um use yourself as an example and just share with them and just say hey listen because i love you i'm telling you this yeah because we do love them yeah and because we want the best for them 
So because we want the best for each other and if you know if you want the best for us and if there's something you want to say then say it. And because we love you, we're going to we're going to share the same way, likewise the same way. Yeah. So you guys have a beautiful beautiful blessed day. If you ever come across in a flea market and you see a bible on the ground, pick it up and buy it or dust it off and put it if this is the word of God, guys. I know it's just paper. I don't worship pages. But the but the words in it are life. Amen. It's their life, you know, and it's like I couldn't just uh walk away from it. Th this book was written to be read. And I thank God that the Lord gave me the opportunity um that you know, 24 hours ago, who knows where this was. But now it was used for the glory of God to share this word. It has a home. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Bye. Have a good day. God bless.